My name is Tyler Meesom, and I am the co-director and executive producer of the documentary series Murder Among the Mormons. The only way to keep a secret between two people is to kill one of them. It's kind of true. The state of Utah has long been the home of the Mormons. I love the gospel with all my heart. They are driven by history, and they want to preserve documents. Mark Hoffman found document after document. First editions, history, Americana, worth $1.5 million. He was a rock star. Religion sometimes breeds amongst people some extremes. The first explosion ripped through a downtown office building, killing one man. The second explosion outside of a holiday home claimed another life. Panic began to ensue because two bombs suggest a serial killer. Then the shock came. There are very expensive documents in the automobile. This is an original? Yes, this is an original copy. The Salamander letter gave a far different story of the church's roots. Instead of God and angels, now it's salamanders and magic. This material was potentially devastating. People who wanted to protect the church didn't want this document to come to light. This is speculation. The church was trying to acquire it in order to suppress it. Everyone's a suspect. What do you think about lying for the Lord? It just started snowballing. Machine guns, bombs. We all should have suspected. Secrets just can't be kept. That is a trailer from the Netflix docuseries, Murder Among the Mormons. And this is Factual America. We're brought to you by Alamo Pictures, a London and Austin-based production company making documentaries about America for international audiences. I'm your host, Matthew Sherwood. Today we're talking about the huge Netflix docuseries, Murder Among the Mormons. Bringing the extraordinary story of Mark Hoffman to the big or bigger screen is award-winning producer and director, Tyler Meesom. Uh, Tyler, welcome to Factual America. How are you doing? I'm well. Thank you for having me. Good morning, evening, afternoon, middle of the uh, night, all whenever the, anyone's listening. All the above, yes. You know, we don't know when they'll be listening and we're a global podcast, so uh, it could. it's going to be all the above, I think. Um, Again, as we discuss, uh, so I've heard in the trailer, uh, it's Murder Among the Mormons. It's on Netflix, in case anyone doesn't know this yet. Uh, and congratulations. What a big hit. Uh, I know it's been, I believe it got up to number one here in the UK. Uh, I think it plateaued at number two in the US, but it's uh, uh, even the New York Times still has it on its top five Netflix doc list. Uh, Noel Murray at the New York Times says this is an unusual true crime docuseries concerning not just some illegal acts, but also the foundations of religious belief. So um, congratulations. Thanks. Thanks. Who's looking at the numbers on Netflix? I don't look. That's for sure. I never I never <laughs> glanced at it. Not once. <laughs> not once. Not once. Uh, uh -uh. Not didn't call up any of your friends. Say, look, you just got to get on today because that might just put a, push us up to yeah. one. Yeah, we, we, we peaked at two, mm -hmm. which is, you know, nice. Would have been nice to hold the title, the championship belt for mm -hmm. just a little bit. The cup over my head, if you will. But two, we're pretty good with two. Okay. Well, I think, and it's got staying power because I think this this come out a few weeks ago, and it's still, like I said, New York Times. Others are still saying it's. Uh, if you haven't, if, if I don't know, you've been living under a rock, or you just haven't gotten around to it, it's definitely one worth worth watching. So, uh, it's it's staying up there for it, sure. It's, it's a strange place to be when you premiere a, a film on Netflix, and you know my previous films were basically we we make the film and then it'd play at a festival and then another yeah. film festival then it'd travel then at some point someone yeah. would put it on tv and then you'd put it on netflix this is just like it's on netflix which is you know where everyone wants to be anyways yeah. and they push the hell out of it and then the whole world gets to see it and then netflix is a machine and a week later there's a new toy 
and <laughs> everyone's playing with that new toy. And I mean, at this point, at some point, our film just becomes a, a used VHS at the back of the blockbuster video, right? <laughs> Deep in the caverns of Netflix's algorithm. <laughs> but for now, my fair skin is basking in the glory. So well, I well, long may it last, or as last as long as it can. Um, right. Uh, hey, okay, it's fairly, you know, at this stage now, pretty good assumption that many people have seen this, but um, you know, maybe tell our listeners what this, uh, what this series is about for those who haven't had a chance to, to watch it. Sure, and I will say for those who haven't seen the series, if you're listening to this podcast, I think you will enjoy both the podcast and the series if you watch the series before listening to this podcast. So if you haven't watched it, go ahead and go. We'll wait for what, three, that's two and a half, three episodes, of two, about three, three hours. hours. Yeah. So go ahead and okay. we'll just wait here. I guess I can tell you some jokes or. Yeah, or, um, smoke them if you got them. Does pe do people even do that anymore? I don't know. <laughs> or uh, we can pause it, I suppose. They can pause it. Okay, so. Wow, okay. The, the so documentary series, Murder Among the Mormons, is essentially about a series of bombings that occurred in Salt Lake City, Utah in the mid 80s. And these bombs targeted two individuals uh, who picked up packages outside of their office and home and killed these two individuals. And then it set forth this massive investigation. The next day, a bomb exploded in a car and it, it injured a man by the name of Mark Hoffman. And Mark Hoffman was a dealer in antiquities, most specifically in Mormon antiquities. So it set forth this investigation to try and find out who planted these bombs, but it also deals with this person, and I'm just going to spoiler alert it right now, Mark Hoffman yeah. uh, was a massive and unbelievable forger of documents, uh, and his intent in many ways was to forge these documents to sell to the Mormon church, or as they prefer to be called right now, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which I don't have the time for, so I'm just going to say Mormons because it's easier and it just has a nice alliteration. Um, and he, he tried to sell these documents to the Mormon church and basically was successful and got a little behind and planted some bombs and killed two people. And that's the not the best elevator pitch I've given, but there it is. <laughs> well, talk, we'll get to this, to this equivalent, a documentary's equivalent to an elevator pitch in a little bit here. But uh, one thing that uh, I wanted to ask you is, uh, so I'm of a, of a certain age. I would have been in high school when this happened. Uh, my wife also is from the States, so we, we live in the UK now. Um, but I was a little surprised. I mean, this, you know, I would have been watching national news then. It, it just... It, the, the story seems so little known in a way, yet it was, it was big news at the time. Um, any, I, you know, and I think I've even seen reference to the fact that you did, you know, you, you're from the area, you would have been much younger, I think, but you don't, it, it wasn't like a story that loomed large in your, in your upbringing or anything. No, and I, you know, I, I live in Salt Lake City now, and I, mm -hmm. I was raised outside of Salt Lake as a child. So, uh, but it was always this story that was kind of in the myth the mythology of Utah and the Mormon faith. Mm. However, I do think, well, A, most people don't know it. Even in the state of Utah, I was surprised how many people knew very, very little about it. Um, and I think part of that is, is like, I mean, we don't remember what happened last week for the most part or care. Trump yeah. will tweet something and we forget everything else that happened. And thank God he doesn't do that anymore. But, um, and also, I think a lot of people were embarrassed about what happened mm. and how they were fooled. And, the Mormon church being one of them. So I think they tried to kind of keep this under the rug. What that did allow us as filmmakers was to be able to tell the story as it happened and to kind of keep mm. secrets, to not reveal uh, that Mark was the criminal and Mark was a forger. We tried to kind of dole that out mm. throughout three episodes. Yeah, I was going to, I was going to ask you about that later, but uh, I mean, you are in essence your storytellers, so that was a con. You know, you're you're thinking, you know, eventually, you know, you decide it's three three episodes, and we are going to slowly pull the curtain back. Is that uh, you know that is how you approach it? I mean, in, in many of my stories, and I think the essence of good storytelling is how long can you keep a secret? How long can mm -hmm. I sustain the suspense to an audience before I absolutely have to tell them that piece of information in order to drive the story forward? Um, 
keep them on the edge of the seat, you right. know? Uh, and so that was one of the things we wanted to do is just kind of keep these secrets as much as we could and as, as, as long as we could until at some point the audience goes, Oh, okay. It was, I get who it is. Yeah. Um, and it, we, it, it was enjoyable. It was really nice mm -hmm. to be able to kind of hide some things, if you will, and, and build up a, an individual only later to tear him down. When I guess you said, as you said, this, this does help us relive it as it happened because people would have been doing the exact same thing. Who's doing this? Oh, surely it's not this guy who blew up in the uh, MR2, which I hadn't thought of of an MR2 in many a year, but there we were, you know, on the screen. But, sweet uh, ride. It's a sweet it, ride. <laughs> did take me back to high school. But uh, <laughs> I think, um, you know, uh, it it is it is interesting because I think that's what you you really get with this film. Um, my goodness, the '80s never looked so old in my life. I think uh, having seen so, so much of this archive. But uh, um, one thing you shed light on that I was unaware of was this whole dealing in antiquities and certainly in the early history of the of the uh, Mormon Church. Um, and and that's really seems to is that really hitting a boom period starting in the '80s. There's always an interest in collecting antiquities. Uh, and there is a cutthroat industry in collecting these antiquities. And anytime you find yourself in a uh, profession that is cutthroat and also dealing in millions, if not tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars, you're bound to find some nefarious individuals. Yeah. The Mormon church uh, has a, something of a dictate in many ways to collect their history, albeit a very short history. I mean, they were founded in 1830. Mm. Uh, so they, they have a, a pretty rich, detailed history, and they're not only the church itself, but the members like to collect items. And the church is, in many ways, it was kind of founded on finding treasure. I mean, we mentioned it in the film. Yeah. Joseph yeah. Smith found gold plates, and he transcribed them, translated them into a Book of Mormon, treasure hunting. So this is the setting in which Mark Hoffman thrived. This is the ballpark in which he could play in, uh, was this environment that loved history and tried to cherish their history. And also in some ways tried to hide some history that may uh, be something of a black eye to a major religion mm. slash business. Yeah. And also um, there's this eagerness to find this history, maybe more easily fooled, I guess. But then as you, as the film sheds light as well it's not just the church that's uh is fooled i mean you know you've got these uh dealers in antiquities in new york who have right. nothing to do with the church that uh are are are, are fooled by uh, this this fella i mean it's uh it's 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 quite amazing mark was genius he was a brilliant brilliant forger and he was the entire package as far as forgery uh it, he wouldn't just forge a signature yeah which is common, you know, George Washington sig signatures are a dime a dozen. That's the most forged uh, signature in, 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 in the world. Yeah. Uh, but he would forge entire letters and currency and, you know, documents and contracts and maps and poems. And he'd get the paper right and the ink right and the writing style correct and the verbiage right. And mm. if it was a letter, he would get the postage right and the days and the days of the postage and the price of the postage. And then he had this ability to create a narrative and a story to invent the provenance or provenance, I've been told. Mm -hmm. I've been saying provenance for so long that a dealer corrected me. Provenance. Mm -hmm. um, the provenance of this document. And he'd create a story behind it. He'd web the, weave this web of how he found it, which would make it much more interesting. And then he'd have this, aw, shucks, look what I found kind of attitude. He didn't come off like a sleazy used car salesman. He had this yeah. like, golly, I found this in a basement somewhere. Yeah. And it, it, is it worth anything? Yeah. And he had the whole package to sell this. Plus, he was just able to keep a secret. You know, yeah. I mean, few of us have that ability to like, I think all of us innately would like to pull off a big caper in a big scheme. But the fact <laughs> of the matter is, is most of us would not be able to not tell our buddies about the bank. We just, you know, the, exactly. the, the, the truck yeah. we just stole. And yeah. Mark was able to, for decades, just hide these secrets. Um, and so he was the, he was the whole package as far as a forger, 
Uh, conversely, he also made some really stupid ass mistakes. Yeah. Uh, he was horrible with money. And then he, and that's ultimately his downfall. He just got behind. He spent money where he shouldn't have and kept promising documents to people that he couldn't, he, his forging hand couldn't keep up with his forked tongue, if you will. Kind of almost created this one man Ponzi scheme in some ways, didn't he? Um, I mean, one thing you, one thing I was curious about, because if, if I've definitely seen it, um, how did he, you know, he, I don't know what his background was or uh, education, but, uh, you know, they, these documents are going into electron microscopes, they're being dated, and yes, they're definitely, this is the ink is a hundred and something years old, or the papers this stage. How did he manage this? Because he was just using these, you know, he had this little room in his house where he's <laughs> uh, just doing all the magic, if you will. Uh, and how did he you know, some really bizarre, th you know, incredible things he figured out you could do, like to make a, a coin look older, you know, and, and things like that. Right. And, and, and Mark, I mean, he didn't happen upon this. And he, he, there's no, you know, how to forge documents 101 yeah. class in college. He, he learned this over decades and years and researched intently. Um, and, and mostly, well, when he was 14 years old, uh, and we show this in the film, he forged a yeah. coin and he, he collected coins and he realized that some coins were more valuable than others. And he, he had an electroplating machine and he turned a, a nickel or a penny, he changed the C to a D, which made it much, much more valuable. And he sent it into the US Treasury and it was verified as genuine, thereby making it worth thousands of dollars to mm -hmm. a 14 year old kid. But I think moreover, look, when I was 14, I was telling my mom, I got a C instead of a D in, in English class. <laughs> he was changing the mint mark from a C to a D. And, and I felt amazing if I got away with a lie. Mm. Mark fooled the bloody United States Treasury. You yeah. know, that's remarkable. And so I think he got that innate feeling of deception. I like this feeling of deceiving. Mm. And he, he had a need to continue it. He had a need to continue and get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. We touched briefly on some of the skill he had as a forger, but just one example of how he would create a forgery. I think the Oath of a Freeman is his Mona Lisa. If he hadn't have planted these bombs, that would be in the Smithsonian. It would be somewhere amazing. Most of his documents would, but he would find uh, a paper. He, he, you know, he knew, for example, the Oath of a Freeman, we'll go through it quickly because- yeah. Can be me droning on about boring <laughs> shit, but I'm not going to. The Oath of Freeman was printed by a guy named Stephen Day. It was the first printing press in the United States. It was brought over by a ship. The printing man, the, the owner of the printing press died. This individual just kind of took the printing press and started printing it. Um, but he only brought over X amount of pieces of paper from England at the time. And so Mark had to find the paper that matched that exactly. So he searched in libraries and libraries and li libraries and found the exact paper in an old book um, in, a, in BYU library. It had the same chain marks. And then he used that to, uh, he made a printing press, but he had to replicate the same printing letters, create a plate, grind it down so it looked old enough, make, he knew the text of the Oath of a Freeman, but he didn't know, you know, he, there was no copy of it in existence. So he was able to kind of create his own. Then he, what he would do is he'd get old letters, an old paper from that era, from that same era or before, and he burned it in, you know, small kiln. And he'd take the ashes, he'd mix it with beeswax and distilled water and other ingredients uh, that I can't remember. It probably shouldn't tell because people are going to forge another Oath <laughs> of a Freeman. Yeah. Um, and that's how he would create the ink. And then he'd roll it on this plate and put it down on the paper. And there he had the other free man. Um, so everything was correct. Then he would do small things like we show in the film, the electroplating, but he would do certain small things like um, he had, he'd put old documents between bags of wheat in the basement and, you know, little worms would crawl through and make holes in it. He would create water stains on documents. Um, he forged an Emily Dickinson poem that fooled Emily Dickinson experts. And he used the handwriting of her and the, uh, the paper that she would use. I mean, most of us can't even write a limerick that would fool anyone. He wrote an Emily Dickinson poem. So to be able to channel and, and what he did, and I actually got a letter about how he did that. He told someone after he, he, he was in prison that he, he, he read her poems for about an hour and found her muse. 
which is amazing as an artist to hear that. He found mm -hmm. and borrowed Emily Dickinson's muse so that he could write a poem. But he wrote this poem and one thing he did is he wrote the poem in ink, but on the back of the paper, the back of the poem, the old paper, he wrote in pencil up at the top, Aunt Emily. And so what it did is it created this story to those who found this poem, to Emily Dickinson mm -hmm. experts and scholars would say, oh my God, who did she give this to? What, did she give it to her cousin, her nephew? Why did they write on the back? Where was it? So it built this mystery. Those fine touches is what he would do that just made him the full package as far as a forger. So, so as, a, and actually this has, this actually comes more towards almost the end of the uh, the series when we go into all these details and have people talk about his genius. Um, but I mean, what drive, uh, we've talked a little bit about what drives him, but he, you know, with this creative genius that he had, he could have, he could have had an amazing legitimate career. I mean, but what, what drives someone like that? Do you think? As storytellers, I think we always try and find a, a, a we always hope for an antagonist and a protagonist. Right. And I think in today's modern storytelling, uh, and non-scripted included, there are flawed protagonists. Mm. Uh, your hero doesn't need to be Clark Gable, who has, maybe has a drinking problem or some small flaw that he has to overcome. They right. can be flat out assholes who are terrible people who are doing mm. terrible things. And ultimately we cheer for you know, Breaking Bad. And I forget his character name, but yeah. we, we want him to, to succeed even though he's a criminal and a terrible person. So that's something we always went into. And in the, the superhero, Lex Luthor, Superman, there are individuals who have essentially in many ways the same power. One just goes this way and one went this way with it. Mm -hmm. And Mark Hoffman at some point did decide to spend his life deceiving and trying to get away with lying as much as he could. Had he mm -hmm. turned right instead of left, who knows what he could have done. The fact of the matter is as well is he planted two bombs that killed two innocent people and yeah. for nothing more that we can understand than just to buy some time so he could continue this fraud. I mean, that's all a criminal and a fraud conman wants. More time, mm. more time, more time. And he, he killed two innocent people. Look, if when he bombed, when he planted these bombs, he was down, he owed about $1.5 million. Decent amount of money. Mm. In 1985, it's a lot of money. But if he would have just threw up his hands and said, you know what, guys, I, I'm a fraud. I'm a fake. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, I did all this. He probably would have been, he'd done five to 10 years. Yeah. And he would have got out and been, in, you know, he'd be working for the FBI right now. You exactly. Know, could have, written, could have written a book. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Because yeah. our famous fraudsters who've done something, who've done similar. Um, you know, so. Frank Abagnale. Yeah, know, exactly. If you can. The dude yeah, exactly. like, is a millionaire now. He yeah. sells books and he had a, you know, he had Leonardo DiCaprio play him. <laughs> Which is, isn't everyone, is that's your dream, ultimately, like to have Leo, Leo <laughs> uh, well, or Tom Well, I, I don't even, I, not, never once have even, even uh, entertained that thought, but uh, uh, believe it or not. But uh, yes, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, I've, I've even, uh, I used to work for a company that had, uh, anyway, he used to speak at their conferences and things like, you know, it was like, mm -hmm. he's, he's a superstar in this, yeah. in this field. I mean, it's, uh, but yeah, I think you, you, you're kind of, well, you're not just kind of, you're hitting on a point too, because there's something, there's almost like there's a chromosome missing, missing or something because um, he just, um, he's just so, I don't know how best to describe it, almost matter of fact about these things about, yeah, mm -hmm. I, had, I had to kill someone to buy me some time. Um, almost like doesn't even appreciate what he's, what he's done. Uh, and I think that was interesting about even trying to go after the parole board um, because they, yeah, that's the yeah. worst parole hearing ever. I mean, he, he just did not show empathy or sadness. Yeah. He basically just said, well, they're dead. And I didn't care. He literally said, I don't, it could have been a child or a dog who picked up yeah. that bomb. It didn't matter. So no, I don't, I don't think he'll ever get out. Um, yeah. Yeah. fortunately, but, um, but, uh, he, he, he definitely, is a unique individual and I'm no analyst, but he's most likely a psychopath of some sort. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, we're going to have to, uh, let's take a quick break uh, for our sponsor and uh, we'll be right back with Tyler Meeson, co-director and executive producer of Murder Among the Mormons. You're listening to Factual America. 
Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter at Alamo Pictures to keep up to date with new releases or upcoming shows. Check out the show notes to learn more about the program, our guests, and the team behind the production. Now back to Factual America. Welcome back to Factual America. I'm here with the co-director and executive producer of Murder Among the Mormons, Tyler Meesom, uh, on Netflix, if you didn't already know that. Um, we've been talking about this uh, incredible figure, uh, so Mark Hoffman, but uh, Tyler, I mean, uh, what? How did you get involved with this? Who was, the, you know, who had the idea for this film, and what what drew you drew you to this film in the in the first place? You know, I am a documentary filmmaker, of course, and I've made a number yeah. of uh, documentaries. Uh, some of them, many of them, pertaining to faith uh, and belief, and why we believe certain things. One of my films, my first documentary, was called Sons of Perdition. In the UK, I believe it was called Leaving the Cult. Is what the BBC Storyville changed it to. I think it's Leaving the Cult: Colon. Sons of Perdition or something oh, like that. Oh, is it? That. Something I, like that. I, yeah. It may um, be, yeah, yeah. And, and that followed kids who were kicked out of a Mormon polygamous community. I myself was raised as a Mormon. Uh, I have mm. consequently and gratefully left the faith and no longer believe in its tenets, principles, practices, or treatments in many ways, or history. Mm. Uh, and then I made another film called uh, An Honest Liar about James the Amazing Randy and, and the UK. Yeah. I think that was called, um, God, I don't remember what they called it but it was uh, BBC Storyville. Yeah. It was a much more titillating title. Uh, try and make Murder Among the Mormons more titillating, you say. <laughs> now you pretty much had to live with that one. That's a <laughs> very good, illiterate, fun. It's got murder, it's got Mormons. Yeah. Um, and, and so I've always been kind of interested in why people believe certain things. And I think in today's world, we're, we're more beset in false belief. Mm. We literally have at our fingertips, literally most information we'd ever need right on this little yeah. angled glass thing called yeah. a phone. But yet people believe stupid shit. They just mm. believe nonsense. And, and there's always going to be someone who's trying to sell you a faulty bill of good. There's a snake in the grass, always willing to pawn some kind of forgery to you, whether it's the former president or some jackass who thinks that there's, Bill Gates is putting microchips in your vaccine. So I was always fascinated by this. And Mark was someone that I was always interested in how he was able to apply mm. these uh, individuals and sell them what they wanted. So I had read a book about it and I said, I'm going to make this film. Uh, and that was in 2017, mm. early 2017. Uh, so it's been four years and uh, just started the process. Jared Hess uh, is a gentleman whom I know. He's a former, he's a Utah boy as well. Yeah. And he, he created and directed Napoleon Dynamite. And uh, w we, we've been friends for a long time and uh, we decided to do this together. So, so can I just say, I have to interrupt there because please. Jared wasn't able to make it this evening. I lost all kinds of credibility with my children because when they heard I was going to get to talk to the director of Napoleon Dynamite, yeah. I immediately went, I don't know how many levels in their eyes uh, because it is like a cult film in my house. So it's like, you know, it's uh, so that's another another podcast, another discussion. You, you, you still could. And Jared is unfortunately, you know, we had scheduling conflicts with this podcast. Yeah. Um, and Jared is in Mexico uh, because he can, I guess. So he he's in Mexico, <laughs> but you should talk to him because he was a, a blast to work with and teaming with, you know, a narrative yeah. filmmaker. Right. And with a doc filmmaker. And I, I yet to really see any uh, examples of that where a narrative and a doc filmmaker have teamed together, uh, at least with seasoned narrative doc filmmakers. It was fun. It was really amazing. And for him doing something like this was quite a, a, a stretch. You know, he's made typically comedies and wacky comedies. Mm. And this has elements of levity in it. This is a mm. very fun uh, series and we intended to have levity because the last thing we wanted was a murder fest of blood and drama and crime and heartbreak. And anytime you can put levity in a film, of course, it makes the drama more dramatic and the mm. drama makes the levity more funny. So we just kept pitching this thing around and eventually it found a very nice home uh, in a small little channel, a uh, little niche channel called Netflix. So <laughs> we were fortunate that they gave us about 50 bucks to make it yeah okay um, and we squeezed it we made it in a weekend put it on their little channel and a few and, people have watched it 
amazing you know youtube or netflix kind of uh yeah what are you what are you going to do uh i think uh i mean be- even before you get to that stage because i think you had to you it took a little while to get this pitched to people um i i don't normally watch other interviews because i like coming up with my own questions that everyone else has already asked and not knowing you know being blissfully unaware that these that everyone asks the same questions right. I'll, but, I'll find a way to give you the same answers i gave yeah, yeah, regardless okay. <laughs> but so. uh I mean, how does a film get to that next step? Because uh, I've, I have been on brainstorming sessions at studios and you, people have all these great ideas and everything sounds cool. But how do, you, how do you become confident that there is an audience for it? I mean, I guess you're a seasoned documentary filmmaker, so you, you have a certain uh, experience with it. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of great ideas out there that then don't even make the light of day. Sure, there's a lot of shitty ideas too. Well, that's fortunately, and there's a Not, lot of shitty ideas that do see the light of day, yeah. which is uh, worse. It, you know, it, it's it's not easy. I mean, I'm not gonna. It, it's really, really, really difficult to have make a film, finish a film, get a film seen, and get it on the air. It's exhausting, and it's trying, and it's for the you know fact of the matter is, it's non scripted. It's there's just not that great of money it's okay but it's really not if i work this hard trying to get an a a widget off the ground i'd probably have a swimming pool but i don't i have a bathtub uh it's so but when you find when you decide to make a project and you decide which project you're going to make and it's not it's very frequent when someone says i want you to make this project it's all set up you have to basically come up with it on your own and you have to know that a, it's a project you can do. B, you can get access to. C, someone's going to buy the thing. Mm. And D, are you just going to hate this thing? You know, you just going to, because it's not like a commercial where you shoot a commercial over a couple of days and you're done mm. with it. This is years of your life and passion and time and effort and energy. And ultimately, when you say yes to one thing, you're saying no to other things. So this process of getting it off the ground was, I'll be frank with you, Jared and I took this out um, uh, and we got no's. We got passes from everyone and i'm not even joking everyone including netflix Mm. and everyone said no and it was disheartening and we had a great sizzle we had a great team we had a great package and then we brought on the bbc uh, bbc studios and alejandro melendez came on and then he brought in joe berlinger and joe berlinger of course is the grandfather of true crime and joe berlinger basically came in the pitches and said i like these guys it's a great story and um everything was different at that point. So we took the same package out twice and got passes first mm. and yeses after. But you must, were you ever tempted to say, wait a minute, maybe there's something we're not getting right and we've got to tweak it or we've got to change it in order to... I mean, no, we always yeah. knew that there was a great story there. If anything, what we did do is we pitched it. Uh, I think one of the issues, and for anyone who's interested in film or whatever, is yeah. we we were kind of in the early stages when we first pitched it of the fact that it's not just about a documentary. It could be a documentary series and -hmm. the initial world of documentary series were very long. Um, Making a murderer was what (sighs) 10 episodes. It was, it was way too long. Wild Wild country was like eight episodes. So we initially pitched this as six episodes and I, and and also we pitched it as like, it can be a doc or it can be a narrow, it could be a documentary or a documentary series. And we kind of didn't know at that point. Yeah. Uh, and we pitched it as a six part series and Netflix said, we'll give you three. And uh, interesting. Uh, and, 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 you know, and we were content with that. It, it allowed us to tell a tight story. And I think it was a, a better move for the story in general. I, I was going to thank you for that, actually, because having watched some true crime recently, I won't name which ones, but uh, right. you might have mentioned one or two of them already. Um, the uh, yeah, they're they're just exceedingly too long. It's like yeah, the, you get the yeah. feeling like you're being used, like they're milking right. this. They want right. you, you know, this is going to affect the algorithm somehow or, you know, by right. By and making... once you once you get past episode four, like you got to go full hog. Right. At yeah. that point. Um, yeah. I mean, I watched The Vow and it was good, but ten, nine episodes. I was like, man, I just can yeah. I can I drive faster to the end of this? Yeah. Um, and, and that's a real common topic coming among non-scripted right now is how many episodes is too many and how many is too few. And I don't know the answers. Isn't it all, almost the, the word of wisdom has always been you, how long should it be? What as long as it needs to, to tell the story is, you know, I don't know if that's being a little bit naive, but uh, um, if you can tell it in an hour and a half, tell it in an hour and a half. 
you know, I mean, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. I, and, and I think being forced to the most important part of documentary filmmaking isn't what you put in the film. It's what you leave on the floor. Yeah. And what the stories that you think are fascinating ultimately just aren't fascinating to a worldwide audience, which is what we were aiming for. We, this film is playing in Indonesia and yeah. in, you know, and in Kentucky. And how are we going to appeal to those two people at mm. the same time? And ultimately is how can we streamline this story and leave any fat on the ground that's not necessary? And also redundancy. That's one thing that drives me nuts is redundancy in a story. I already, you already told me that. I don't need to hear it again mm. kind of feeling. Or I hate it. My personal pet peeve is when you see the same footage used um, a second or third right. time, you know. Right. Um, right. <laughs> you know or the reality TV style, which mm. is like, just show us something and then you go to commercial and then just tell us again what just happened 10 <laughs> minutes ago. And I'm like, I'm exactly. right. I was right here. Like, I, you don't, exactly. Exactly. my memory's not, I'm not a goldfish. Yeah. I remember that it happened, but they're yeah. filling out, you know, they're yeah. trying to fill it out. And I do think part of it is, is that in many ways, producers, you know, a little peek behind the curtain, but you get paid per episode. Mm. So if I can make, nine episodes i'm getting nine paychecks as opposed to two or three but isn't don't you think streaming's kind of liberating now because um you know i saw one recently we had on had them on the podcast actually i think it was five episodes but one was 26 minutes and the next episode was like 49 and then you know it was just kind of uh that chapter could be shorter so it was shorter you know Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, it forces you to kind of create a three-act structure within a three-act structure or within, you yeah. know, three parts is what, what we did. How are we going to end this? Which is actually kind of freeing in many ways, yeah. story-wise, to go, I'm going to try and make, like we did, episode one is the setup, ends yeah. with the bombs. Episode two is the investigation, and it ends with the conviction, if you will. And then episode three is how he did it. Mm. And if we were making a doc and we revealed Mark was a forger, we've had to, we'd have had to put that how he did it throughout. He forged this yeah. document. This is how he forged it. And then mm. we dole it out throughout, but we, we, we always wanted to like put the heavy stuff at the end and, um, and having that three part series allowed us to do such. Yeah. And I guess it also helps to have some, uh, interesting and excellent cast of characters and, uh, I mean, did you have any problems lining up talking heads for this? Because I, I, it seems like, uh, except for the victims, unfortunately, uh, everyone seems to still be alive and they all came on camera and the prosecutors, the antiquities dealers, the family, uh, all very, co- seemingly all very cooperative. By and large. Yeah. I mean, obviously we didn't get the interview we wish we would have gotten, which is Mark Hoffman, but right. Um, I mean, were there people that were involved in the saga that are no longer with us? Yes. Did we include them in the story in many, you know, in any reference? Not really, because yeah. it's, it's difficult to uh, relay a storyteller when they're not there to tell that story. But by and large, everyone talked to us. Um, and by and large, everyone had amazing stories to tell. There were some that hit the cutting room floor. We probably yeah. interviewed, I don't know, six to eight people that didn't make the film, which is, you know, sad as a filmmaker to say, thank you for giving us your entire day and telling us your amazing story. And Mm. that sure was a great day and good storytelling for us, but no one else will see it, unfortunately. (laughs) But by and large, you know, in editing, we just decided, let's just keep it the inside. We have the inside people. We don't need someone to, you know, who was outside giving us reference to it. And, And so we leaned on that. Yeah, that's right. You don't like rely on any, uh, well, I think there is one, but that, not like you've got journalists or news anchors or whatever say, well, I remember this. It's it's literally the people who were all involved or friends of Mark's or dealt right. with Mark, you know. There's one author, and he was yeah. also uh, the representative for the, the Mormon church. So he was able to kind of speak for them, but he'd written a book about it. Yeah. Otherwise, everyone was directly related, even including the, you know, the, the broadcaster. Yeah. The the news reporter who was a news reporter at the time. So, yeah. and I think that's a, I mean, if you can get those individuals telling the story from their own personal firsthand, that's the best way to hear it anyways, of course. Yeah. And they were, I mean, excellent at it. Um, and very good. I mean, ex- <laughs> some great accents on there. 
Uh, yeah, but yeah, very Mormon. <laughs> I, I mean, it was a white dude film. It is old <laughs> white, old white fat guys, and exactly. I love them all, and they're amazing. But by and large, this was a beard and belly fest exactly. of white dudes, well, um, and we knew that. We yeah. wish we had more females involved in it, um, but, but we just, you know, they weren't yeah. part of the story. Yeah. I think one of them said, uh, I forget. I don't remember the names of it. Uh, one of them said something about his wife accusing him of being greedy. And my wife was looking at him was like, you definitely are. I mean, look at that belly on you. You know, you, you're definitely <laughs> greedy about something. You know, he is, that guy is amazing. Brent Ashworth has the most unbelievable antiquities collection you will ever see. He has everything from Butch Cassidy's gun to Abraham Lincoln's chair to amazing. Joseph Smith's pen to like just remarkable materials, remarkable stuff. So these guys were collectors and that was actually really helpful in many ways because um, they collected their history. So when we yeah. interviewed them, they're like, I have boxes full of old papers and tapes and photos and forgeries for you. Yeah. And we said, great, we'll take them all. Excellent. Yeah. It's uh, no, it's, it's, it is incredible. I think what you've, I think yeah, I've seen in another interview, you've, you, you know, you could have made that six hour, six episode one, cause you had certainly had more than enough archive to uh to keep you going not that you just want to fill it with that but uh um you know yeah i think we we could have told some stories that there are some amazing stories with the saga and it doesn't Mm. just it's not just five years of forgeries it's a whole Mm. lifetime and yeah you encounter into it the setting in which he was able to work the mormon church and some of their possible deceptions and deceits and forgeries Mm. and hidings it's it's a 200 year story yeah. And have you been, uh, are you and Jared surprised by the success? I mean, you're probably going to say no. We knew we had a great film, but uh, did you really expect it to take off like it, like it has? Jared is, uh, has been in a position, uh, he made a film that everyone has seen. I mean, he's one yeah. of the few, I mean, you could say like what Star Wars and Napoleon Dynamite and mm. maybe Pulp Fiction, like everyone in the world has seen, even though my mom's never seen Pulp Fiction. So you know, he, he's kind of had this, uh, this previous massive sensation of a movie. So for many ways, I don't think he'll ever <laughs> attain that again. And maybe you can ask him that. Yeah. But we, we knew we had a great story and we knew we had a titillating tale. Uh, and we knew that uh, we had an interesting title, which Netflix said you should, you know, initially the title was uh, The Salamander. Mm. Um, which is, you know, obscure and interesting, but, you know, it doesn't make you want to click on it. And then it, we, we were going to go Salamander Murders, and that felt like some kind of, you know, crushing toads under your exactly. amphibians under sounds your like, boot. Sounds like a nature doc, yeah. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, Netflix suggested Murder Among the Mormons, and they said, you'll get tens of millions more views. And we said, great, what font do you want it in? <laughs> you know, all caps, bold, how do you want it flashing? Uh, what do you, so... We, we knew that it was a great story um, and we knew that it would be in 191 countries across the mm-hmm. globe. Uh, and so we hope for good, good audience. And, you know, we're very, we're very grateful for what it's had. That's interesting. You almost went with the salamander because the one thing that, you know, as someone who's, you know, I wasn't born or raised Mormons, but Mormon, but I have it's had, not too late. Know. It is yeah. not too late. I, we could send those cute little white boys over with their white shirts and ties. I, I see them every uh, every so keep, often. They're give me your address. Here. I'll uh, I'll uh, <laughs> I'll have a book of Mormon sent to you, uh, sir. But uh, the uh, I mean that's the thing, and we've as we find out in the film that it's this it's that one of the main letters, the one of the main forgeries. It's a big issue. I just always assume this whole thing about the salamander. We don't need to go into details about this, but I always thought that that was one of the tenets of the, of the, that's what, if you want to talk about the impact and we talked, I said, at least I don't remember those bombings and things like that, but what did I go away with? Somewhere along the way, I picked up with the fact that I thought that the salamander was a tenant of the, uh, of, of the religion, you know? So it's kind of interesting, isn't it? You know, when we when we started this, Jared and I are you know Mormon history nerds, and we knew everything about the story. And we brought in these two editors from LA, uh, and and neither of them had any experience or knowledge with the Mormon mm. faith or with Utah or this story mm. in, at all. And uh, one of them eventually, I was like, we need to tell more story about how Joseph Smith and he it was a salamander instead of an angel, and how weird that is. And he goes, what the hell's the difference? Like why? 
<laughs> a talking salamander is actually more common than an angel. Like I've yeah. seen salamanders, I've never seen an angel. So in many ways, it was apples and oranges. Mm. Uh, uh, you know, a heavenly being or a mm. white talking amphibian that punched Joseph Smith in the face, supposedly. Um, that's supposedly what happened according to the salamander letter. Which we know is now a forgery. Uh, yes. That one, that one, yes. at least. You know, yes. but the thing that Mark Hoffman did is what he was so good at is yeah. he would heavily research. And when he, he, he found that there were rumors that Joseph Smith had told people that it, there was a toad, that a toad okay. had actually led him to the golden plates. So when he came up with this document that said, by I salamander, see. it wasn't so far out of left field that the Mormon church said, okay, maybe there is some truth to this. Mm. We didn't cover, he, he found so many documents that he sold to the Mormon church that oh, it could have ultimately really destroyed their religion. And if he'd mm. have kept going, he would have continued to do such things. Well, was that a bit of his intention, you think? Or was he just more in it for the money? And you, he, he had a ready market, he thought, in terms of these things. The reason Mark Hoffman did this is, is multifold. One is, yeah, he was making good money. And if you ask him, and he said that it was money that drove him, I think he needed to feed the beast of deception. Mm -hmm. I think he liked fooling people. But I do think he had something of a vendetta against the Mormon faith. Mm. And as a wolf in sheep's clothing, he knew he was able to take it down in some aspects. But the power he must have felt, you know, there's this photo and we put it in the film where he's a college kid and he creates this document, the Anton transcript, and he creates it literally in his kitchen using, and this is his first forgery, major forgery. Mm -hmm. He uses household items just there in his, in his kitchen. And he did it all during the day before Dory, his wife, came home. And he made this document. He shows it to a professor at his college. And the next day, he's literally in the upper echelon of the Mormon church. And these are individuals who are prophets, seers, and revelators. One of them is a prophet who supposedly define, divines uh, uh, you know, revelation from God himself. And he's sitting there, and they're looking at this document, and they pass it off as genuine. The feeling he must have had knowing mm. that that little piece of paper he made in his fucking kitchen two days before yeah. And now they're, yeah. it's fooling them and they believe it's genuine. That, the mixed feelings he must have had, I mean, he wrote in his journal that night when he found mm -hmm. it. And he, I don't know why, but he had a journal and he, he wrote, you wouldn't believe what I found today. It's this unbelievable forger, un unbelievable document. I found it in a book. Wow. And why he did that, I don't know if he just needed to fool himself. I mean, he even said, if somebody says, if a if something is certified as genuine, then it becomes genuine. That's oh, his yeah. own words. So those mental gymnastics he must have done to say, you know, this document, it, it, the power he must have felt to create and change history, mm. you know, to to change and alter what millions of people believe and know and pray to every day and believe that this is why they are in a religion. To have that power to change that in your basement with a little bit of ink and an old piece of paper that you mm. stole from a library, I mean, mm. it's a remarkable feeling, I suspect. I mean, do you, um, given your background, you've said both you and, and Jared have these uh, Mormon roots. I mean, does it make you more or less sensitive in terms of, uh, I mean, obviously Netflix is no stranger to sensationalism, and, uh, but you don't, it's certainly not a sensationalist film. Um, I mean, some may be disappointed that it isn't, I, you know, but uh, um, does that, do you take, does that play into your considerations at all? Do I, you know, do I believe in the Mormon church? No, I don't. Yeah. Do I, but did, does that affect the story I was telling? No. Ultimately, yeah. um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to put my own spin or opinions or ideas into the film, especially when it's such a great story that it doesn't you know. need that. Uh and the fact of the matter is, is people can take from it what they want. You know, uh, my favorite movie quote is Billy Wilder. And he said, let the audience figure out two plus two and they'll love you for it. Mm. And we continually tried to, you know, just give the audience just enough and let them figure it out. If you want to make the connection between Joseph Smith and Mark Hoffman, it's there for you. 
if you yeah. want to believe that you know mark hoffman was just an atheist who was out destroyed a, a heavenly a heavenly messenger of god then you can believe that as well uh and and that's i think um uh, what we tried to do with this series. That, that's a great Billy Wilder quote, actually. We'll have oh, to you should look up the uh, Billy Wilder's 10 Rules of Screenwriting. It's, mm -hmm. it's remarkable if you're interested in film or a filmmaker or as a non-scripted filmmaker. Uh, it's very important as well. And then ultimately, I mean, do you, do you think this film has something to say about the foundations of, of religious belief? I think this film has something to say about belief in general, whether yeah. it's religion, politics, uh, com commerce, antiquities, capitalism, um, antiquities, yes. yeah. uh, sports, you know, it, interesting people believe what they want to believe. It, it takes a bit for you to just say, I, I, this isn't true. Yeah. Even though I want it to be true, it's not true. And uh, I'm going to put aside my biases in order for this to be true. And few people have that ability. Uh, and when we are confronted with an individual like Mark Hoffman, who is so good at selling this uh, and can sell it to a mass audience, some people who can do that, then it's even easier to spread a lie. I mean, Mark Twain said it, a lie uh, will spread across the world by the time the truth is still putting on his shoes. Yeah. It's a paraphrase, but essentially that's what he said. Uh, we, we want to believe the lie most of the time. Mm. That's a very, I think that's a good place to at least stop about talking about specifically about the film. And I think, uh, just to ask you, cause we're coming to the end of our time together. It's hard to believe. Um, but what is next for you? Lunch. I'm going to, oh, okay. some... <laughs> not literally, uh, oh, beyond, oh, beyond oh. the next 24 <laughs> yeah. hours. Uh... I thought you'd ask me what was for lunch. That would really be another hour of conversation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm always looking for interesting projects. Um, I have a number in development and pipeline um, in various stages of uh, development. Uh, at this point, I don't know. I made a film prior to this called I Want My MTV, which is yeah. about the birth of MTV and music television. And uh, I kind of like, I love music. I love telling stories of music. So I may do something in that genre, or I may just make murder, m more murder among the Mormons or <laughs> more murderer among Mormon as, as... Well, you have to do the, uh, don't do the making a murderer season two thing, like two or three years later. And, yeah, no, and I'm not going to do that. No, no, please. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I, at the risk of uh, offending those, we've never had them on and now we probably won't. But uh, uh, yes, please don't do that. That was a hell of a series at the time. It, it that, was. That worked. And yeah. I can understand. Look, it, it's easy as a filmmaker mm. when you are offered something that is in your wheelhouse. It's easy to sell. It's easy to make. Yeah. Um, and typically it's quick money to do something else, but, um, I do get offered things along the same genre and I, I kind of just don't want, I want to venture into something new and different and exciting, but I always like levity. I, I mm -hmm. like comedy. And I think that's one thing that is ultimately missing from documentary in general is just fun and, and comedy and laughs and happiness and joy. There's so many of them that are like just such downers be it cult or climate change or war. So that's ultimately one thing I'm always looking for is something that can make people laugh in a documentary. If I can uh, second that um, to a degree, certainly, I mean, just based on our own experience with this podcast, the, the episodes that are the most popular, the ones that get the most views or listens are, are I mean, they may be about serious subjects, but they don't, they don't necessarily take themselves too seriously. The ones that are very like somber, you know, this is horrible, you know, and, and they are talking about a lot of times they are talking about horrible sure. things and things sure. that do need to be dealt with like climate change or the, you know, but gosh, we, we certainly don't get many clicks on those. You know, it's, 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 <laughs> right. it's, it's interesting. <laughs> if you want somber, you can turn on the news. We're, yeah, we're exactly. living somber right now that it's nice to have an escape and i do think that's one of the reasons that murder among the mormons did well mm -hmm. uh was that there are moments of of uh, of, of levity yeah. despite the pain that still lingers because of it well thank you so much for coming on it's been a joy having you tyler yeah, uh of course a, that was fun. about time yeah no it was a lot of fun for us if 
when you do finally decide uh, what that next one's going to be, if we uh, haven't scared you off, we'd love to have you on again. Um, I will happily tell you all the tales of my lunch as well. Okay. Well, we will keep that in mind. Um, and those who were, um, well, I guess if some maybe are still waiting to come back to listen, because they're on probably episode, start just starting episode two now. So I just want to give uh, another thank you to Tyler Meesom, the co-director and executive producer of Murder Among the Mormons, uh, available to watch on Netflix. Um, also, shout out to our engineer, Freddie Besbrod, and the rest of the team at This Is Distorted Studios in Leeds, England. A big thanks to Nevena Paunovic, our podcast manager at Alamo Pictures, who ensures we continue getting such great guests like Tyler onto the show. Finally, a big thanks to our listeners. As always, we love to hear from you, so please keep sending us feedback and episode ideas, whether it is on YouTube, social media, or directly by email. And please remember to like us and share us with your friends and family, wherever you happen to listen or watch podcasts. This is Factual America, signing off. You've been listening to Factual America. This podcast is produced by Almo Pictures, specializing in documentaries, television, and shorts about the USA for international audiences. Head on down to the show notes for more information about today's episode, our guests, and the team behind the podcast. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Alamo Pictures. Be the first to hear about new productions, festivals showing our films, and to connect with our team. Our homepage is alamopictures.co.uk.